So good morning, everybody. This week's Torah portion is Chaye Sarah, which means the life of Sarah. And it's so interesting. I mentioned it last week that every time uh, I look into the Torah portion, everything leads to understanding this dark situation in the world and giving us perspective and courage and strength to overcome these very dark times of angst in, in the world and especially in Eretz Yisrael in the Holy Land and for Jews all over the world, how, how frightening time it is. So I want to share the story of this week's Torah portion. It's very, very fascinating. It's also a very beautiful story. It's the story of Avraham's wife, the first matriarch, Sarah, passes away. And now Yitzchak, the famous Yitzchak, from the sacrifice of Yitzchak, the, who's going to be the next patriarch, is needs a wife. So Avraham asks his second in command, Eliezer, his servant. They call him a servant, but he's really like manages all of Avraham's finances and investments, his hedge funds, his businesses. <laughs> <laughs> he's he's Yaakov's a excuse me, he's Avram's aid. And Avram says to Eliezer, I want you to go find a wife for my son Yitzchak. And I don't want you to go here in the land of Israel, in the land of Canaan. I need you to go back to where Mes uh, uh, Haran, where I came from. And over there, I want you to find a wife. Now you might say, shouldn't Yitzchak's wife come from the land of Israel? his neighborhood, but Avram realizes that Yitzhak's wife has to come from Haran. And he sends Eliezer. And Eliezer says to his boss, to his master, to his, to Avram, he says, how am I going to know who, where to find a wife? How am I going to know how to do this? So Avram says to him, Hashem alakei Hashemayim, um, God, the God of the heaven and earth, is going to send a malach, an angel, before you and help you find and find the wife for Yitzchak. So he's telling his servant, Eliezer, don't worry. You don't have to worry. There's going to be an angel walking before you who's going to find the wife for Yitzchak. So Eliezer says to Avram, and let's say she doesn't want to come with me. I find the right girl. She's beautiful. She's smart. She's rich. <laughs> she knows how to cook and bake. <laughs> she's kind. Uh, she doesn't want to come. She might say she doesn't want to come. So Avram says to him, don't worry. There's an angel who's going to walk before you. And in this one sentence, it defines one of the most pivotal, important, fundamental insights from the Torah. What does it mean an angel who walks before you? As opposed, when we see in the Torah portion of Noah, it says, and the angel walked alongside Noah. Noah walked with God, with the angel. And Avram walked before God. And Eliezer, the servant of Avram, the angel, representative of God, walks before him. So Hasidus explains Noah walked with God. With means God is holding him up. God is holding him under the arm. Like, you know, a couple walks together hand in hand. So you don't yeah. stumble, you don't fall, you need directions. But it's not in you're not independent, you're depending on the angel, you're depending on God. Avram walked before God. He knew the path to take. He walked before God because he knew exactly what God wanted from him. And Eliezer, the servant of Avram, the angel walked before him. So when an angel walks ahead of you, what do you do? You follow. 
The angel makes a right on King Street, you make a right on King Street. The angel stops to <laughs> a drink, you take a drink. You don't have to make any decisions. The angel is leading the way. What does it mean, the angel walking near you like Noah? It's like a backseat driver. Go here. Don't go here. Make a right. Stop it. You almost bumped into the car in front of you. It's a support system. It's a support system. The angel is holding you up as you walk your path or drive your car or do whatever you have to. So the fact that Avram is telling Eliezer, the angel's walking in front of you, you don't worry about it. I'm sending you. But really, the angel of God is going to set the tone and the path. You don't have to make any major decisions. But now there's another very interesting part to the story that nowhere does it mention who the servant of Avram is. It just says, Eved Avram. And Avram spoke to Eved. He spoke to a servant. We know it's Eliezer because we know who his servant was, but it doesn't say his name in the Torah portion. It only calls him the Eved. And then there's another quirky thing that comes up a little later that he's called Ish, a man. First, he's called a servant in the beginning of the story. And then suddenly he's called the man. And we'll soon analyze why he starts off as the Eved. He's called the man. And at the end of the story, he's the Eved again. He's the servant again. So Eliezer goes through a metamorphosis, so to speak. He's the Eved. Then he's the Ish, the man, which means like the angel. And then Eved, he becomes once again the servant. So Avram says there's going to be a Malach walking in front of you. He takes 10 camels. He takes his entourage of people. You know, you need a chef to make the kugel for the path. You need, the, you need a guard. He takes an entourage. And because, again, the angel leads the way, instead of, let's say, a two-week journey, it's a three-day journey. And Eliezer is thinking to himself, how am I going to know where to go, how to find her? It's a needle in a haystack. It's like saying, I'm going to go to Times Square and find a wife for Yitzhak. Even when you go to a singles event, it's, it's a needle in a haystack. So he says to God, there's going to be a sign. I'm going to go to the well because we know the well was always the meeting place in every town. The well was like the mall or the town hall. <laughs> Or the, the 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 pizza shop hangout because everybody needed water. So everyone congregated by the well and they shared news and they shared uh, gossip. This was the meeting place. And if a girl comes out and not only offers me water, offers water to my camels. In other words, she shows extreme kindness. Eliezer says to God, I'll know it's the girl. So he comes, he travels to the, he comes to Haran, he comes to the well, and lo and behold, he sees a young lady, Alamilus, matchmaker, matchmaker, make me. She, and he asks her, excuse me, can I perhaps have some water? She says, of course. And also for your camels? And she brings, starts bringing water for the camels too. And he realizes, wow, the minute he comes to the well already, the girl appears. She offers him water. She offers water for the camels. He says, okay, hold on. He runs to his uh, camel bags. He brings out jewelry. He gives her jewelry. And then he says, and by the way, who are you? <laughs> What's your name? And she tells him. My name is Rivka. I'm the daughter of Besuel. Besuel was Yitzchak's first cousin because Besuel and a Avram's brother, Besuel was the son of Avram's brother. So now this is a very strange story. He doesn't even ask her any questions. He brings out the jewelry and then he says, and by the way, who are you? Who does that? Who gives jewelry, expensive, expensive jewelry? Remember, Avram was very wealthy. He didn't send a custom jewelry. He sent gorgeous jewelry, and I'm going to read the jewelry. And then he says, and by the way, who are you? And then she says who she is. 
And then she says to him, I'll go with you. In other words, she doesn't even wait for him to say, no, you want to marry my very handsome master's son, Yitzchak? He's tall. He's rich. He's smart. He's the future patriarch. <laughs> she says, I'm going to go with you. Already we see Rivka is a strong personality, a decisive personality. So I'm going to finish the story and then I'm going to go back to all the questions. And she leads him to her house. And there he encounters her family, Besuel, her brother Lavan, two famous swindlers, two famous crooks. <laughs> And that's why she's called the Rose Among Thorns. Because though her family life is one of being part of the mafia, she chooses not to follow that path. She chooses to be a rose among a family of corrupt individuals. And he introduces himself. And what's very fascinating is we always said the Torah is very concise. It's like cliff notes. Yet... The story is repeated now in the words of Eliezer. Now, what I just shared with you, the Torah is telling us the story. And Eliezer came to the well, and he meets the girl, and he gives her the jewelry. And, and, he, and, and, and after she finishes giving the water, and then she says, I'll go with you. And then he comes to the house, and he repeats to the family the whole story. He said, you know, my master, Abraham, sent me to find a wife for Yitzchak. And I came to the well and I saw your daughter and she gave me water. She gave my camels water and I asked her, who are you? And she told me I'm the daughter of Besuel. And so then I took out of my uh, ca camel bag jewelry and I gave her the jewelry. And the angel of God walked alongside me. So Besuel and Lavan and the wife, Mrs. Besuel, hear this beautiful story. They go, yeah, it's a great idea. We like it. And he gives them gifts and he gives them beautiful delicacies that he brought with him for the parents of the girl. Now, the next morning, they change their mind. They don't want to let her go. But we'll get to that in a second. But one minute here, the story totally changes. In the Torah, when Avram says the angel is walking ahead of you, what does he tell her parents? The angel walks near me not the angel walks in front of me. Then he also reverses the story. When he comes to the well, he sees her kindness, he gives her the jewelry. And then he says, who are you? But when he tells the parents the story, he said, and I asked her who you are, and she told me, and then I gave her the jewelry. So there's already two things where he twists the story. So question number one, the story of the betrothal is 67 passages, unheard of. Even Shabbos is not 67 passages. Not only do they tell us the story, now Eliezer repeats the story. It's one of the longest sections of a story in the Torah portion, in the whole Torah, actually. And so why does Eliezer switch around the story? Why doesn't he say, and uh, the angel walked in front of me, so I knew what to do. And then I met her. I gave her the, I, I gave her the jewelry. And then I asked her who she was. He changes it all around. Let me end the story and then we'll go back to that. So in the morning, they don't want to let her go. They go, you know, she's young. Let's wait a little while. Maybe she doesn't want to go. Maybe she really doesn't want to go. Maybe we, so Eliezer said, ask her. And here we learn that you cannot force anyone into a marriage. And she immediately says, yes, I want to go. And the family, Besuel died the night before. I'll talk about that in a second. Her father passed away because he tried to poison Eliezer. He wanted to get the gifts, but he didn't want to give his daughter. So he tried to poison Eliezer's drink. God made a miracle. The drinks were switched. He died. Eliezer wakes in the morning. The father is nowhere to be seen. But the end of the story is that it says, and they accompanied the ish, the man, and the eved, the servant, took Rivka back home to meet Yitzchak. So now we have to analyze why is he called eved? 
then man. Eved means servant, then ish, then man, then man, and then Eved. At the very end of the story, he's again called the servant. And it would all you'll see come together in one beautiful theme. So the reason he switches around the story, because this is an easy thing to catch, is imagine I came to you and I said to you, you know, I want your daughter to marry my son. And I tell you the story. How did you meet my daughter? Well, I went to the well to get water for my camels and for myself. And your daughter came. She, she gave me all these drinks and I was so impressed. I said, what's your daughter? What's your name, Bubala? Oh, my name is Rifka, the daughter of Basuel. And I look and I go, wow, all the signs that I told God are going to happen, happen. She's the one. I give her the jewelry. Now, let's say I tell the parents, I met your daughter. I gave her jewelry and I asked her who she was. The parents are going to think you're crazy. They're going to think this is an unstable man. He's nuts. Who gives somebody jewelry and they don't even know who she is? We don't want our daughter going with this crackpot. So he changes the story to make it more palatable to the parents. No parents wants their daughter to go with a mashugana. You know, you like a person, you buy them an ice cream, you offer to buy them a pizza, a coffee from Starbucks. You don't say, oh, honey, you know, you fed my camels. Here's 1,200,000 worth of jewelry <laughs> to take home with you. <laughs> So in other words, in order to tell the parents the story in a way where they would acquiesce to let their daughter go willingly, he has to change it around a little bit. Also, why does he tell them, and the angel walked beside me, not in front of me? Because if he tells Basuel and Mrs. Basuel, that guess what, guys, this is a done deal. God walks in front of me. This is done. You have no say in the matter. He makes it, again, more palatable to them. So he says, you know, I felt an angel accompanying me, an angel helping me find so that the parents shouldn't feel like it's being stuffed down their throat. Ah, oh, you need it. This is it. It's a done deal. God decided that's the girl. You don't have a choice in the matter. He makes it, he uses diplomacy to share his, uh, his wishes to bring Rivka back to meet Yitzchak. And that's why he changes the story to make it more palatable for them. So he doesn't say to them, yeah, the angel walked in front of me. God decided it. Look at that. The minute I came to the well, she was already there, which means that the angel put all the pieces in place before Eliezer even gets off his camel. She's already waiting there. We see the divine providence. He didn't want the parents to feel like, oh yeah, it's decided. They're, remember, they're not, matriarchs and patriarchs, then are not exactly exemplary citizens of Haran. They're not exactly the nicest people. So he has to do it in a way where it's done in a nice way. And again, he doesn't say to them, I gave her the jewelry even before I knew who she was, because I knew this was the one, because she met all the signs that I told God. So he says, you know, I introduced, I asked her who she was, and then I gave her the jewelry. So the parents are like, nice, this sounds good. <laughs> But you see, Basul is a ganef. He tries to, at night, poison Eliezer. And in the morning, he passes away. But Rivka tells her, her mother and her brother, I'm going. This is for me. I'm going. I'm going. And now in those days, for a girl to speak up is no easy feat. Remember, they're living in a time when, in, not in Jewish life, in the secular world, in Haran, women were second-class citizens. No girl told her father, I'm going, I'm doing. The fact that she speaks up also shows that that's why she becomes the next matriarch. Because she has the stellar personality and she has the, ener the strength of character to first of all, not follow her father's footsteps. He, was a, he also worshipped idolatry. She didn't. Now, if you're living in your father's house and everybody prays to the Buddha and everyone bows down to the idol in the corner, you follow your father. In those days, you don't go against your father's will. But she didn't. She didn't. She refused to follow the path of idolatry, immorality, etc. And that's why she becomes the next matriarch. So you have to understand her personality. And also going back to the well. You know, when I was a little girl and we learned the story, 
it sounds so, and I meant last year we did a whole uh, lesson on this. It sounds so silly, simple. What's the big deal? You know what the big deal is? She could have said to him, oh, your camels are thirsty. You go fill up the buckets and the trough. And where were all your men you came with? I'm, the, I'm a little girl. How much energy do I have? She herself went back at least, think about it, 10 camels. Their humps were down, the Torah tells us, which means they're out of water. You know how many troughs of water you need to feed each camel's hump till it goes back up? Well, I would say about 20, 30 buckets. And she has to go back and down. And remember, a well is down. You have to go down the well, up the steps, boom. No, no, no. It wasn't so simple. Oh, she fed the camel. She fed me and my men. And yeah, she's such a nice girl. It was extreme kindness and compassion. Now, why didn't she say to Eliezer, oh, why can't your men help me? She thought to herself, if Eliezer is not offering, something must be wrong. She didn't, she had the sensitivity and the refinement not to say to him, excuse me, Jane, can't your husband feed the camels? Diane, your three able-bodied sons can't help me? <laughs> she felt that something must be wrong. Otherwise, they would have offered to bring the water. The fact that they didn't say it to her means, oh, you know, they really need help. Like they say, the, the joke, a guy comes to the door of a very wealthy person, knocks on the door. The woman opens the door. Can I help you? He says, I can't. I haven't eaten in, in, in 12 days. Help me, help me. She says, wow, I really admire your self-control. I wish I had such self-control to lose weight. <laughs> she didn't get it. Guy's starving. So the sensitivity not to say, oh, maybe you should bring the water yourself. So now, um, why is he called servant, then ish, and then servant? is this is really what I want to talk about. This is like the defining core lesson of this week's Torah portion that I feel one of the most beautiful lessons. That in life, in life, we have an angel who walks in front of us. An angel who walks in front of us. The question is, can we identify and let go of our, sometimes our, um, views, our motivations, our, what we think, to allow the angel, the word of God, the mission, the purpose that we have to lead the way. So in the beginning of the story, why isn't his name mentioned? To show that the mission that Avram sends Eliezer to go find a wife, he cannot use his own name. He has to take away ego, identity, everything that he thinks should be done and follow exactly what Avram tells him. Well, sometimes someone gives you a job. They say, I need you to do this job. So you say, but you know, I, I don't, boss or whoever, honey, I don't think this is the way it should be done. I think it should be done like this. I actually think it should be done like that. I disagree that it should be done at all. Rashi says that Eliezer, what is he saying to Avram at the very beginning of the conversation? I have a daughter. Why do you need me to go to Haran? I grew up in your house. My daughter grew up under your tutelage of you and your wife. My daughter would be a perfect match for Yitzchak. Why are you sending me to Haran, a place of depravity? You ran away from Haran. You're sending me back there? But when he realizes, Avram knows he has a daughter. When he realizes Avram is insistent, he knows now a father would feel hurt. Oh, you don't want my daughter? You don't think she's good enough? I'm not going. Send somebody else. He's called Eved to show you that although he had personal interest, he had a, a mind of his own. That's why he was Avram's second in command. But he was, he was a very intelligent, brilliant person. He was the CFO, chief financial officer. Yet he puts aside his name and his ego to do the mission and the purpose for which he sent out. And in the beginning, he's called Eved because he has, though he's a servant of Avram, he has his mind. But then when he sees the angel leading the way and he comes to the well, and as he's dismounting from his camel, the girl appears, he says, indeed, the angel is leading the way. 
The angel has shown me the path. I just have to follow. And that transforms the way he looks at himself, that all I have to do the, is open myself up to the word of God, open myself up to the direction God is leading me, and everything will fall into place and be the way it's meant to be. So the beginning, he's an Evid. When he's called, the man came to the well. That's when we see, based on Hasidus, the transformation where he's able to open himself up to follow God, to follow the angel. He realizes, how is it possible? Normally, you get off the camel and then you start thinking, okay, which girl at the well could it be? Is it that girl, the blonde? Is it the brunette? Is it the one with the short hair? Here he gets off his camel and literally this girl appears. He realizes everything is the hand of God here. All I have to do is, as Avram told me, follow the malach, follow the angel. Don't be a backseat driver. The, the angel's not walking near you. The angel is walking ahead of you, which means all you'd have to do is follow, follow, follow. So he's transformed from the ever to the ish. Ish means angel. How do we derive it? If you remember the story that Abraham is sitting outside of his tent on the very hot day after his circumcision, and it says three men are coming, Anashim, and Rashi says three angels. So when it says Ish, that's how we derive that Ish means an angel and not just a man. Could have been, Abraham says, follow the man. Follow my man. We know he's telling him, follow the angel, Avram is telling him. But though I'll tell you, Jane, to follow the angel, you may not be ready to follow the angel. You have your own ideas, your own vision, your own uh, opinions on the matter. So sometimes it takes time to follow the angel. Sometimes it's hard to follow when you're an independent thinker. But you realize later that following the angel doesn't mean you give up your identity. It means you, you define your identity. You enhance your purpose and identity. And then another place where they call an angel a man, and you know, Ish, when Joseph is sent by his father to check up on his brothers before he's sold into slavery and they, they put him in the pit, he doesn't know, he doesn't have ways, he doesn't have a GPS. It's miles and acres of land. He haps upon a man and he asks the man, have you seen my brothers? And the man gives him the exact GPS location. So Rashi says, how could a man know where his brothers are exactly? Because he was an angel. So from here we derive how we know Ish is not a man, but it's an angel. Where When Avram says, you'll follow the angel, and later on it calls Eliezer the Ish, he's called Ish, because he's following the angel. He becomes one with the angel, in a sense. I know it's kind of like a complicated idea, but I but I feel it's like a powerful idea. What do you think? Is everybody digesting this? By the way, when I put all these commentaries together, it took me a day to digest what exactly this means. I had to read it and read it a few times from different sources to integrate what it meant but I'll give you an, a very beautiful story. The Lubavitcher Rebbe had a cousin who lived in Israel. Her name was Zelda. She was a very famous poet. So she says a story that everyone, uh, when, when, when the, the Jews reclaimed Jerusalem and the wall from Jordan, she says, I came into Jerusalem, shachachti shemi, I forgot my name. I forgot who I was. When I walked in, I was Israel. I was the people. I was one with my brothers and sisters. I didn't even have my own identity. Shachachti shemi. This is what it means. Eliezer, I forgot my name. I don't even have a name because I'm now the angel. I'm part of a bigger picture. I'm part of a destiny. I'm part of God sending me on a mission to perpetuate the people of Israel. And also you see it with Moses. Remember the story of Moses? He says to God, if you don't forgive the Jewish people for the sin of the golden calf, take my name out of the Torah. And in one Torah portion, Moses' name is missing. And that draws tremendous attention. How come Moses' name not mentioned? 
Because sometimes the absence of the name is more powerful than the name. Not seeing Moshe's name in that Torah portion reminds us how Moshe was willing to sacrifice everything for his people. So when Zelda says, Shachachti Shemi, I came in Jerusalem and I didn't even know my name. My name was your name. My name was my brothers and sisters who were slaughtered for Israel. My name was the soldiers. My name was Netzach Yisrael, the eternity of Israel. That was my name. So sometimes the not name is more powerful than the name. So when Eliezer is called Ish, the man, walking in the path of the angel, is defining a person who has opened themselves up completely to allowing the destiny to happen through him. He's a messenger. So sometimes there's so many opportunity where we can't hear God's voice where we can't hear the angels whispering into my ear. It's like I was one moment said, Freddie, you know, I heard an angel whisper into my ear one night. Is it true? And I'm like, it's true. And you're lucky that you're sensitive to the voice of an angel. How many of us never heard the voice of an angel? Sometimes, you know, you're saved. You feel like somebody blew on your shoulder or tapped you on the shoulder and you're saved or something happens and you wonder, was I imagining it? No, it is the angels that accompany us through life. And the Torah says that every act of goodness creates an angel, a good angel. And every act of negativity act causes a negative angel. And these are the angels that walk with us through life. And we hope to have more of the neg positive angels who accompany us, not the negative angels. Because it's these angels who lead us and stand by us. And exactly, sometimes you hear a whisper or you feel a breath and you're wondering what's going on. That's your angel near you, in front of you, leading you. So the end of the story is Ish, the family accompanies the Ish with their daughter. And as he walks back home, he becomes back the Eved. He has fulfilled his purpose right now. He brings her home. And she's riding on the camel and she sees in front of her a very, very handsome, beautiful person. It's Yitzchak. And she, she, when he turns around to walk towards her, she covers her face with her veil and she literally falls off her horse. Love at first sight. She's so overwhelmed with emotion that this is going to be her future husband. And that's where we get the uh, custom of covering the bride's face with the veil before the chuppah. You, you, the groom comes and covers the bride. He checks to make sure she's the right girl because we don't want to mix up like with Leah and Rachel. <laughs> and then he marries her. And it says uh, that this was a, a, one of the greatest, most beautiful relationships in the Torah, the marriage of Yitzchak and Rivka. One more beautiful, beautiful thing is that when she comes to meet Yitzchak, it says he brought her to his mother's tent, Ha'oha la Sara, the tent of Sarah. What is the significance in Hebrew of Ha? It's called Hey Hayidiya. That Sarah's tent had three special things. Do you remember Jane from last year? Three special things. Oh well, I I just remember that. Not anybody could go in there and take over. Um, you know that that she she was that highly regarded. So maybe maybe um, Rivka would be able to, but I don't remember the three things. That's fine. So Sarah, because of her holiness and piety, had three special things that happened in her home. One, there was a cloud always over her tent, a cloud of glory, a cloud of Hashem. Second, when she baked her challah, when she baked her challah bread, it had a special taste. And three, when she lit Friday, before 18 minutes before sunset, her Shabbos candles, they remained lit the entire week. And then she relit, brought new candles for the next week. Oh, so yeah. when she passed away, all these three signs disappeared if the servants baked challah didn't have that unique taste, the candles did not remain lit and the cloud disappeared, the cloud of God. 
Now Yitzhak wants to marry Rivka, but he has to make sure that she can step into the shoes of the to be the next matriarch. He had a responsibility. So he brings her into the tent and suddenly the cloud appears. And when she lit Shabbos candles, they remained lit all week. And when she baked challah, the challah had a unique special taste and blessing. And he knew that this would be his future wife. So this is the significance. He brings her into his mother's tent, Ha'ala Sara, to point out that she now assumed the leadership and the qualities and the spiritual energy of his mother. So they say that uh, Yitzchak and Rivka, again, had the most beautiful relationship. He, remember, never left the land of Israel. He was a pure soul. Unlike his father, who came from Haran, came from idolatry, came from Mesopotamia. And he marries Rivka because she's an amazing counterpart to him. She grew up with idolatry. She grew up with immorality. So she... she compliments her husband and she later on will see next week's Torah portion and how she saves her the future of, of Claudius or the future of the Jewish people so we're going to end on this note and 